Tonight we're discussing an issue which is very, very close to all of our hearts, I think, and that's the, the stealth, the stealth privatisation of the NHS. And specifically, what we want to talk talk about is the uh, is the takeover, the takeover of NHS GP practices by the U.S. private sector healthcare giant uh, Centene and its various subsidiaries in the UK. And we've seen this close to home. John Bosco was saying that actually uh, Tro Trowbridge surgery in Hackney has actually been put into the hands of Upper Rose, I think you call it, which is a, a subsidiary of Centene itself. Anyway, we have a great speaker tonight, uh, John Bosco Nawagbo, and uh, he comes from the We Own It campaign. And I really, really rate the We Own It campaign. I really do think they punch above their weight in terms of campaigning for this particular issue. They campaign against privatization, but they also campaign for 21st century public ownership. And if you remember that actually uh, the We Own It campaign even got the, the three candidates in the, in the last leader, Labour leadership election to sign up to 10 pledges on public owners, ownership, including Keir Starmer and himself. Whatever happened to that, I don't know. Maybe we can talk about that later on. But again, it shows you how, um, how much influence this, you know, it's a small team of people, but the We Owner campaign really do punch above their weight on these issues. Now, John Bosco himself has a, has a fantastic background. He started campaigning in South Africa in the 2010s on things like decolonizing the curriculum in South Africa. He's been a campaigner for renters, his campaign for community rights. So well, without further ado then, can I hand you over to John Bosco to, to start your talk? Thank you, John Bosco. Um, so um, I'm going to try and focus then exclusively on what has recently happened with Centene taking over GP practices. Um, um, the most recent cases being in London, um, when, where in February this year, they took over 49 GP practices um, across the length and breadth of, uh, um, of um, London. And as Meg mentioned, one of those practices is um, right here in Hackney. Um, so it's, um, you might actually know somebody who uses um, a 17 um, practice right now. Um, and of course, the context of this takeover is that um, a British company um, founded, I, I think sometime in the early 2000s by six um, student doctors um, called AT Medics, um, decided to sell themselves to, and this is not a, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, this is not a, an evaluative term. They basically sold themselves literally to, the American company Centene um, through their UK um, subsidiary Operas. And um, what that meant was that um, Centene, sorry, AT Medics, having been in control of 49 practices, um, um, Centene automatically became, gained control of those 49 GP practices. Of course, Centene had already been in the UK for longer than that. Um, they had been in, um, in the UK in the form of a company called Centene UK and also in the form of another company called um, The Practice Group. Um, and some of their track record in the UK can be traced back to actions by these um, organizations. Um, so it takes the total number of practices that they control across the UK to 70 and they're now the largest private care, um, pr primary care provider in the UK. Um, yeah, and the CCGs in London, the five CCGs in London, um, in whose areas these practices exist, um, had to approve these contracts and they did so without any consultation with the local patients who are affected, nor with the local leaders who are kind of, who have a responsibility for the people in this area. So the MPs were not consulted, the councillors were not consulted, even local patient groups were not spoken to. So they basically did it behind closed doors. Um, and there's been a campaign since then to try and um, on the one hand, try and get them to um, to scrap the, con the, the contract with Centene. It, that's the subject of a judicial review that has just been launched um, this past week. But there is 
the second prong of the campaign, which is the part of it that we are paying a, a great deal of attention to from we own its point of view of trying to prevent the contracts for many of those practices, especially those of them that are coming off for renewal soon from being um, renewed. And um, before this meeting, I actually was, I spent my entire day preparing a bunch of actions for people in Northwest London to take um, because one of their GP practices controlled by Centene is coming off for renewal um, on the 25th of July. Um, yes, and I did mention to people earlier um, at the meeting that if you would be interested in attending a protest on um, the on the on Thursday, the twenty seventh of May, I would I could leave details for it in the chat here at a later point in the meeting. So, in terms of Centene's, I wanted to kind of capture what is wrong with a company like Centene running GP practices in the NHS um, from the point of view of their track record, but also from the point of view of the question of privatization, right? What is wrong with privatization? Um, but also what's wrong with a company with Centene's track record running our GP practice. Um, in terms of Centene's track record in the UK, um, many of you may know because we have been repeating this ad nauseum for some time now. Um, the Centene actually um, in the form of operas had closed the GP practice in, um, in Harlow, Essex in 2018. And the reason for that was that it was not financially viable. And of course, what they mean by that is that it wasn't as profitable as they expected it would be when they went for it um, initially. And this was that was not the first time that they had done something like that. They had um, already done something similar. And they had, it's not also the, the last time that they've done something like that since that time. Um, under their guys as the practice group in Leicester and in um, Camden, they had also closed GP practices for not being profitable. Um, but beyond the individual examples of um, cases where they have closed GP practices, this is part of their organizational strategy. Um, and can, if, if, you don't, if you don't mind, I'll like to read from a portion of their um, company annual report from 2019, where they say the re-rationalization re of our business activities has been a key feature of our strategy throughout 2019 and has continued into 2020 as the business seeks to divest, uh, divest of activities that have not met profitability targets. As a result, on the 31st of March, 2019, Operas Health Limited exited the Sorry Borders Partnership NHS Trust contract. And on June 30th, 2019, they similarly exited another contract. So essentially, they are admitting in their in their company report, annual report, that their strategy is to exit contracts that um, do not kind of meet their profitability targets, and that carries some massive risk, not just in terms of the fact that this is actual people losing access to a GP practice. It introduces a new kind of social contract into the idea of the NHS of if your GP practice is not profitable then it deserves to be cut off, right? If, if, there is not money, if there isn't money to be made from your GP practice, then it deserves to go. And it's people that are suffering from this, but also the establishment of that principle has far reaching consequences for our healthcare in the mid to long term. And we have an interest in preventing that, that principle from being established in the NHS. Um, in addition to the uh, track record here in the UK, um, of course, they have a much more atrocious track record in the US. And I think that their track record in the US tell us something about how unscrupulous they are and how far they will go um, in their conduct within our GP practices to maximize profit. So they were sued by hundreds of people who they sold health insurance to in the US in 2018, for example, for um, taking their money on a monthly basis um, for ins health insurance purposes and not providing them with doctors or healthcare centers to care for them. Um, that lawsuit is still in the courts right now. Um, they have also recently been sued at the beginning of the pandemic actually for um, systematically underplaying the threat that COVID-19, um, that the pandemic poses to um, prisoners where um, Santine was actually in charge of the healthcare of prisoners in some American prisons. Um, 
in 2020, in August, they were um, found guilty by a court in Arkansas, in the state of Arkansas, of actually systematically stealing the wages of the doctors that worked for them. And um, this, is, this is something that um, there is a great deal of risk that it could actually happen here. Because um, of course, um, the um, Care Quality Commission that looks at the quality of the care provided by um, GP practices doesn't necessarily look at the conduct of these companies in terms of their employees. And that has far reaching consequences in terms of the quality of care people get. Um, if doctors are not being um, appreciated and remunerated properly, and of course, we've also been speaking with doctors who work at some of these practices that are currently um, owned by Centene. And what we're hearing is that they are seeing practices that appear to be motivated almost exclusively by a desire to save money, um, um, which they think has um, impact and likely to have an impact on the quality of care people get. Um, in December 2017, Centene was fined by the state of Washington um, for similarly selling health insurance to people, but not providing them doctors or healthcare centers to, um, to look after those people. Um, in the state of Ohio, earlier this year in March, um, the Republican conservative attorney general of that state actually sued Centene, and they're still in court for that now, for concocting fraudulent schemes to steal money from the taxpayers of the state of Ohio. And the very next month, while Santin was still trying to kick up a fuss about this law lawsuit, um, the state of Mississippi, one of the most conservative states in the state in the US, with a radical conservative um, attorney general, also sued Santin for concocting schemes to steal money from the taxpayer there. Right? And this is the company that's now running 49, 70 GP practices across England. Now, um, the question of whether or not this is privatization is one that we have encountered a few times um, throughout this campaign, partly because from the um, start of the NHS, um, GP practices always had a very unique relationship um, with the NHS um, that is quite different from the relationship that hospitals have with the NHS, right? So GP practices were always independent. Um, the doctors themselves were, um, independent contractors for want of a better description. Um, so in essence, the question is whether or not Centene taking over this GP practice is not essentially one private company selling to another private company. Um, but I think that that does ignore a few important things in terms of just the way the NHS was organized to work. Of course, it was not perfect in the way it was organized, but it was not that flawed um, in the sense that doctors did exclusively, worked exclusively for the NHS. So their salaries were um, regulated by the NHS or by, by um, the Department of Health. Um, and yes, the, the public service ethos was right at the heart of that relationship as well. And from a legal point of view, Centene would not have been able to run GP practices in the NHS before 2004. In 2004, a kind of contract called APMS contracts, um, Alternative Provider Medical Services contracts, um, which allows a company that is not run by medical professionals, so doctors, to bid for and win a contract to run medical services. So a company like Centene, for example, that's basically run by managers whose primary preoccupation is um, maximizing access to data, for example, or maximizing profit or finding ways to limit expenditure and therefore increasing profit um, can apply to run um, a GP practice under an APMS contract and potentially get it. And in some ways, they actually have an advantage over traditional GP practices because there are huge multinational corporations that have a great amount of resources and they those companies, as we've seen, of course, with companies like um, Circle running track and trace, they are really, really good at writing applications, but terrible at de delivering the service. And we all know what has happened with track and trace. Um, and that is the kind of disaster that is sitting and waiting for us in terms of our local GP practices. 
And we actually know that private firms like Centene running GP practices um, are worse for patients than, um, than um, G traditional GP practices. A study in 2017 um, published in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine found that patients who um, used GP practices run by private firms were worse off than patients who use GP practices run by traditional GP partnerships. Um, so in, 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 both in terms of the actual um, track record of a company like Centene running GP practices and the question of this issue as a privatization related issue, it appears quite clear that the loser in any scenario is going to be the patients, people who are actually depending on these GP practices um, for their primary care needs. And um, in most cases, and in our experience, it's um, elderly people, people with, um, with disabilities and young parents with little children who are um, most likely affected by this, um, this issue. And we've been running a campaign for the last um, six months, I think since February, to try and get Centene kicked out of this GP practice by one way or the other. As I mentioned earlier, um, there is a judicial review um, of the decision by CCGs to allow this takeover to happen. We don't yet know whether that's going to be successful, but fingers crossed. Um, but we are also trying as much as possible to force the CCGs um, to not renew Centene's contracts when they come up. And, as I mentioned earlier, we are trying to do so in Northwest London um, next week. So if you're available to help with that, um, I will put in um, the address and time and date for the protest in the chat when I'm done speaking. And um, I'll also put in a link there um, for everyone here, if you can, to simply click and send an email that we've um, suggested and prepared to the members of um, Northwest London Primary Care Commissioning Committee, the committee that's actually going to make this decision and ask them not to renew Santin's contract. Um, um, I'm going to stop there now and hopefully we can have a discussion. Thank you so much, everyone. John Bosco, thank you so much for that. Oh, that was fantastic. A really, really clear articulation of um, the problems and the, and the risks that um, the likes of Santin bring to the, the NHS, particularly on the impact on patients. We're always told that these guys are so much more efficient and so on, but the evidence shows that it actually leads to detrimental outcomes for patients, which is what matters. So, I mean, I'd like to um, turn us over now to questions and discussions, uh, but do you mind if I, can I, can I use uh, the chair's privilege to ask you one question first? Um, I, you know, I would really, really like to know who actually decides to award these people contracts, you know, given, Given all that we know uh, about their track record in America and their track record here, who actually decides to allocate and award contracts to them? Yeah, um, yeah that's a really good question. And um, I suppose that's a question that anybody with um, any common sense should be asking themselves, given the, the track record of this company. And one of the things we have found campaigning on this issue is that common sense is not very common. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that part of what we have experienced is that people who work um, in the CCGs and the primary care commissioning committees, um, I suppose I would put it this way, that they have very disparate pressures. Um, they have pressures coming from the government who are setting a policy direction for them uh, from NHS um, England. Um, but they also have um, local interests in the issue. Potentially, some of them um, may want to keep it open, keep the possibilities open for themselves working for Centene in the future or something to that effect. And there's also, of course, the incentive of, um, and we've seen this, actually, we've seen this recently um, with the chief, um, the chief executive of Centene, the former chief executive of Centene, Samantha Jones, actually being hired to work as a, a special advisor to Boris Johnson. And Tim De Winter, um, who was the deputy director of the National um, te um, Test and Trace Program, was a deputy director of Centene UK and um, um, a higher up person in Centene for a quite long time until he went to work for the government. 
and the Times reported a month ago or so that he already signed the contract to go back and work for Centene in September. So that kind of revolving door creates a perverse incentive for people within these um, bodies, the CCGs and the PCCCs, who would want to ad advance in their careers to kind of play ball. Um, and also people don't generally put a great deal of pressure on them like we are beginning to do. Um, local groups, of course, exist in these areas and have, have been doing an amazing work um, up till now. Um, but they, they, I think that they sometimes get quite used to getting away with things. So they just let things go by. Um, and hopefully we kind of begin to change that um, um, going forward, especially beginning with this issue. That's great, John Bosco. Thank you very much indeed. So our first question is uh, Nick, Nick M, then followed by Fliss after that. Yeah, Nick. Hi, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a GP and I've been involved in the um, sort of uh, protesting on a sort of official level um, about Centene. Um, and I just wanted to uh, your, uh, relate to your question, which was about who has responsibility for awarding the contracts. Um, which legally um, is NHS England. Um, but in this case, they had the ability to delegate that uh, responsibility to the individual CCGs, which is what they did. Um, and it, in fact, there, there are questions about that, the legality of that delegation. It is within their power, but it was a strange thing to do and a strange way to do it. And what, I, and I wanted to sort of also, um, uh, and the, the decisions were made by individual CCGs on direction of chair's action, um, but at the group level, at the North East London CCG, so the merged CCG, um, that decision was taken uh, by the by the accountable officer of, this, of that merged CCG. So there was a lot of nodding. I think uh, it was nodded through um, without very much uh, attention to the due diligence um, question of Centene um, and without any real scrutiny of what the contract meant. Um, and I, if I could just briefly mention um, the, the example, an ex a perfect example of what John Bosco was just talking about, about the revolving door is that Samantha Jones, the, the um, now advisor to Boris Johnson in 10 Downing Street, previously was the one of the three appointed Centene Operos uh, CEO um, who took over the AT Medics contract. Um, and before that, she worked in NHS England as the director for new care models. So you've sort of got this collaboration between NHS England um, and Centene and the government of course are sort of directing most of this because NHS England is just an arm's length body of government. Um, so it's a very good example of how the revolving door in fact has allowed Centene to plop themselves as now the biggest provider other than the NHS of general practice in England. It's astonishing and uh, needs to be called out. Thank you. That's really, really That's interesting. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nick. Yeah. I, can I add a question? Sorry, can I add a question to John Bosco? The problem we've got with the white paper is that CCGs are going to be abolished and uh, the integrated care systems are going to be the new statutory body. So any future decision about what happens to Centene is likely to come from the ICS and that board. Now, I wonder where that account, you know, we write to the CCG, ultimately, they may have no input into this. And so it's, uh, I'm asking where do we need to think how we direct, who we direct these protests to, and how that's done? Yeah. Yeah. That's a brilliant question. Um, do, we, do I take it now? Or do I um, take a few together? Uh, John Bosco, can I, can I just take, can I just take a couple more questions and maybe answer them? at the same time is that okay yeah uh Fliss, Fliss you were next yeah thanks um that yeah that was brilliant and absolutely terrifying hearing about the privatized 
corruptions kind of mates club that's going on here and also that you know from 2004 onwards obviously there's been it's moving in that direction and that was sadly under a new Labour government by by the sound of it um I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not that familiar with what the power is and what the relations are with the patients and what power we do have as patients, if any. Um, but you said that some of the contracts were already coming to an end, which sounds as if they've been around for, for a fair amount of time. Um, and I was going to ask what happens when those contracts are up? Can it revert back to an independent practice? Um, and what do we do as, as patients? And also kind of what is the advantage unless unless they're part of that kind of inner system what is the, the, the is the advantage that the so-called independent gps have seen from this given that it's obviously a company which is siphoning off money you know it's like, i i you know I, I don't understand that thank you okay uh john bosco why, why don't you take those two first and, and then i'll queue up the the next two yeah yeah, um, thank you so much, um, Nick. Um, I, your your contribution, I, some of the things you said, I could not have said them better myself. So thank you so much. And in terms of um, um, when we have the new um, ICS boards, um, I think that things become slightly more difficult from a point of view of from the point of view of accountability. And of course, my suspicion is that that's probably one of the aims of. Um, um, kind of bringing together massive swathes of, 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 of land, so to say, um, covering millions of people. I think that, and for example, the ICS area that's going to cover Northeast London is, um, is going to cover, I think, up to 1.3 million people, if I'm not mistaken, um, right? And that's, that's quite large and makes it quite difficult to, be, to hold them accountable. Um, but I think that just, uh, I, I suppose, a good way to answer the question is to look at it in two stages, right? Right now, the actions we are taking um, are directed at the CCG because they are still accountable for the decisions in the short term. So the question of, for example, renewing um, Santin's contracts in um, for Cambury Old Oak um, surgery in um, Hammersmith and Fulham, um, that's coming for renewal on the 25th of July. Um, the CCG will still make that decision. And the protest that I mentioned earlier that we are organizing is targeted at the Northwest London CCG. Um, when we have an ICS board, which is itself a, a whole different discussion that we could go into for a couple of hours, but there is the danger as well that a company like Centene could actually sit on that ICS board, making decisions, not just about the healthcare needs of the people in the local area, but who's going to provide them? And guess who is the provider of those cares, those care needs as well? Centene, right? So it's, I think that we are at the cusp. So I think it's not an exaggeration to put it that way of losing this NHS as we know it. In fact, I think we may have already lost it um, for some years now, but we're losing it even more um, with the introduction of ICS boards. But and, and we are actually, um, we own it at the very least. And I'm sad, I know that we're we are working in a coalition um, to campaign against the white paper and um, the ICS boards, specifically um, using as an anchor for the whole thing, that element of it that allows private companies to sit on the boards that make decisions about healthcare and is that effective. So, I mean, I don't know that we are going to be terribly successful given the government's majority in parliament, but we will definitely be giving them hell. And we have um, allies in the House of Lords who are going to be able to delay and draw out that bill for as long as possible. And we were able to do it with a trade bill. And I hope that we could be able to do it with this as well. And fingers crossed. And of course, hoping that everyone here is able to support that as time goes on. Um, I think that um, the questions by Fliss, Fliss, if I'm not mistaken, that's how it's said, sorry. Um, are quite really, really good questions. Um, as I said earlier, the GP traditional GP practice, so let me put it this way, the NHS was not born perfect, right? So and there's always that danger of um, describing it uh, when we talk about like going back to like a golden era of the NHS, right? It wasn't born perfect. Uh, in some ways, if we went back to 
that early imperfection, we would be going back to some um, golden era because it's gone so far away from that early vision that even getting that that mediocre thing that we had at the beginning would be so would be would be heaven at this stage, right? But um, it wasn't born perfect, and I think that that arrangement with GPs, specifically in the area of general practice, where GPs were allowed to remain, for want of a better description, independent contractors, was not the best um, arrangement. Of course, it was. We need to take into consideration the political environment at the time and um, the GP strike and a bunch of other things I could bore you with. Um, but I think that the general social contract construct with traditional GP practices is that they don't do it for profit. So a great, a great many of them, um, except for a few, a, a small group that um, somebody I know calls Dr. Preneurs, like the doctors that created art medics, a great many of them don't actually make profit. They, they pay themselves a salary and all the rest of their budget goes into the care of, of their patients. And we think that that's a reasonably suitable middle point until we go back to, uh, we have an opportunity to go back to kind of what we would consider the ideal. It's a reasonably sensible middle point of GPs working um, at, um, at, at in the GP practices with a public service ethos where they pay themselves a good salary um, for the wonderful job they do, but mainly not taking a profit, not, not working with the objective at the back of their minds to save money so they can increase their profit. That is what I think has the potential of really destroying general practice. Um, yeah, and I do think that patients actually have quite a lot of power in this um, situation. There, there are things called patient participation groups. Every GP practice is supposed to have one. Um, not every GP practice has one. And um, among those that actually have one, um, they're mainly just ceremonious things. Nobody actually knows what's happening there and they're mostly deadish, um, right? But in theory, there are, there are things available that allow patients to potentially have power. And I think that um, if everybody um, got involved in their local patient participation group, um, you would be able to know what's happening when they're happening. And you would also be able to kind of put forward um, an argument for doing things differently uh, where you find the opportunity to do. So I would advise anybody here who's not already involved with their local patient participation, participation group to explore the possibility of doing so. Okay, uh, thank you, John Bosco. Very, very interesting indeed. Can I, can I take a question and, or comments now from George then followed by Margaret? Thanks, George. Uh, thank you, Mick. And thank you for having organized this evening's meeting. And thanks to John Bosco for his introduction. And in particular, in his first reply to Mick, raising the, the role of and Ms. Jones, the former uh, Opera Stroke Centene executive, who is now apparently a number 10 advisor on the NHS to Johnson. Uh, two points, really. Uh, first of all, I do suspect very strongly that the development around the GP surgeries is indicative of the direction of travel for the health service as a whole under this government. And I suppose it's worth recalling that Simon Stevens, Sir Simon, to us mere mortals, who is now uh, finally stepping down as the chief executive of NHS England, spent a decade or more in the US and, and worked for United Health. And I suspect he is strongly uh, in favor of at least a partial Americanization of the health service. Uh, of course, the U.S. has a bizarre patchwork quilt of provision. I grew up in the United States, spent the first 22 years of my life in the U.S., essentially. And it, it has to be said that there are genuine centers of excellence in terms of uh, U.S. health care. But there is also the reality of a population where nearly 30 million people are without health insurance, Life expectancy is, I think, lower in the US than in any of the G7 countries. 
And if you look at infant mortality statistics, they are actually worse in pockets in the US than in a number of countries in the global south, including obviously Cuba. In any event, I, I think we need to highlight how bad, in many ways, outcomes are in, in this patchwork quilt of uh, semi-privatized, fully privatized, and semi-public healthcare in the United States uh, as a, a way of sounding the alarm bells about the direction of travel for the NHS. And it goes beyond our ideological opposition to privatization. There will be practical consequences and there will be in many ways, I am without doubt, a decline in, in standards. Two questions, I suppose, to, to John Bosco. I mean, there is one surgery in our borough, the Trowbridge, and I'm not sure if you, you mentioned it earlier, which, which has now gone over to uh, Opro Centene. That's in the South, obviously, and this is a Hackney North meeting. What might be the focus there? I know that there have been, well, one photo op and a, and a protest on the 22nd of April, which was a national day of action. But what can be done around uh, the uh, trial bridge surgery? I mean, unfortunately, I don't think Meg Hillier, the Hackney South MP, has really taken a stand on this yet. I mean, Diane Abbott is, is certainly on board in general uh, with our position on this. And secondly, and I am now retired officially from uni a Unison member, but uh, you know, was in Unison as a very active member for 20 plus years. And I still get the magazine and you know, it is bloody shocking, frankly, for the biggest union in the NHS, Unison, not to have anything in its magazine for members about the threat to the health service that uh, is posed by what's already happened, obviously around GP surgeries and accelerating privatization. And given that the content of the NHS white paper was broadly known uh, prior to the Queen's speech. Uh, you know, so how uh, are you looking from a we own it perspective at engaging the, the trade unions, which are obviously a, a critically or potentially anyway, a critically important ally in doing battle with not only Centene, obviously, but with the, the general trajectory towards NHS privatization. Uh, thanks and sorry to go on for a bit too long. Okay, sorry, Margo, do you want to ask a question as well then? Maybe John Bosco can take the two. Yeah, uh, it's a sort of comment which contains a question. Um, uh, John, you, John Bosco, you mentioned early on in your talk that um, privatisation was allowed into GP practices in 2004 with the introduction of APMS contracts. And I just wondered what APMS stands for. And it sort of rang a bell because Alan Milburn um, was, uh, I mean, that was under a Labour government. And Alan Milburn was a critical figure in the introduction of um, PFI contract, private finance initiative contracts into the building of hospitals. Um, and, you know, all the way through um, the 97 to 2010, um, the Labour Party took a very, very um, quite reactionary. I mean, they were for privatisation. Um, and so today, when and Alan Milburn is now, you know, up to his ears in privatised health. <coughs> so when we're faced now with the Labour Party leadership that doesn't know where it's going and advisors like Peter Mandelson, who come out of that era, who are absolutely wedded to privatisation, it, it strikes me that we've got a, a fight on our hands, not just with the, the health service and, you know, all the things that have been suggested this evening, but inside the Labour Party as well to sharpen up their act a bit. But it's going to be difficult because um, the, the, the sort of turn to a, a more caring, sharing economy and so on, which has happened in 2017 and 2019, um, has just gone, and I mean, I think I think it's gone. I mean, maybe Starmer will go, and then we'll see what happens next. But that that so we've got uh, as as George says, you know, 
There's a fight in the unions, there's a fight in the Labour Party, there's a fight with all these wretched people <coughs> who are increasingly taking over the NHS, and there's a fight with the government. So we've got our work cut out. And I see you've put in the chat what they stand for. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Margaret. Yes, I noticed that George is put it in, but um, it's useful to mention for those who um, can't read the chat. Um, um, APMS contracts stand for Alternative Provider Medical Services Contracts. And um, they essentially are contracts that allow companies that are not run by doctors. Previously, um, a company had to be owned and operated um, um, up to, I think, 70% by um, GPs to run GP services. Um, under APMS contracts, a company can be owned 0% by GPs, you and I. Um, I don't know who here is definitely not a doctor. Um, okay. um, <laughs> um, you and I could practically form um, a company if we have a few million um, hidden somewhere. Not on the millions. <laughs> and um, we'll apply to run a service here in Hackney and the GP, the, the CCG will be tripping over themselves to give us the contract. <laughs> so that is essentially what um, APMS um, contracts allow. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I can say a little bit about labor because um, for, for a number of reasons, I think that um, labor is still very much um, the party that is most likely to um, give us what we want in government, um, right? Um, short of a party like the Greens, for example, or the, the communists of Great Britain or something like that. Um, coming to power, which is it's more unlikely than Labour coming to power. I imagine we all agree on that. Um, yeah, so I think that we have a duty as Labour Party members, and as I mentioned before, I'm also a member of the Labour Party. Um, we have a duty to try as much as possible, um, first of all, to stay in the party, and it's good that everyone here is here, because I imagine that means you're in the party. Um, and secondly, to try as much as possible to influence the party. Um, I don't think that there will ever come a day when we say that the party is a lost cause. I'm sure somebody in, in 1997 or eight or nine would have said it was a lost cause because they were thinking that 1998 was the rest of human history. Um, but then 2017 happened and 2019 happened. Right, of course, the results of those elections were not the best results ever, but at, the very, at least we had a period of six months, or sorry, four years, that we were actually able to shift the direction of the conversation in the country, um, right? And obviously we would have preferred to win. And I think that we can still win. And I mean, I'm not, I actually did not vote for Keir Starmer, but I really hope he wins for, for the sake of everyone who lives in this country. Right, and um, I'll be doing everything I can to help him win. But I definitely will be doing everything I can as well to make sure that he wins on a platform that includes protecting the NHS, um, that includes doing the right thing for people who depend on the public services that we all depend on from schools to garbage collection, to the NHS, to a whole bunch of things that we literally cannot live without as we have found out during this pandemic. Right, and so yeah, just long story short, um, my relationship with the, with, with the Labour Party is very much that of struggle, <laughs> trying to get it up to a place where when it wins, it can actually do stuff for us. Um, yeah, um, George, George really did hit a, str a massive nerve when, when he talked about in terms of um, um, the situation in the US and the risks for what they're trying to transplant into the UK. I think an important, an important element of this, and, uh, and I've often pointed this out, the, the portion of healthcare in the, US, in the US that they're actually trying to, trans, to transpose into the UK, um, when, when campaigners speak about it, they often exaggerate a bit in terms of what they're actually trying to bring to the UK. So there is, as George pointed out, a portion of US healthcare that is private, 100% private, where you purchase health insurance from a company like Centene or United Care or uh, what other companies do they have? Whatever they have, right? And when you get sick, you go to hospital and in theory, in theory, this 
health insurance companies covers the, the cost. Of course, we know that um, if you've watched Michael Moore's movie, Sickle, we know that um, they don't actually do so. Um, it's part of their job. They actually employ people whose job it is to deny you care when you need it. But let's operate in theory for the moment. So there is that part of it, but there's also the part of it that's provided publicly, right? So at the very, I would say the very best of that, it's not the very best of the best, but at the very top of that is veterans healthcare in the US. Um, um, essentially people who go to fight for the US and come back, they have purely social, socialist healthcare, um, right? So that's at the top of it, but then, Right at the bottom of that, you have things like Medicaid and Medicare, um, health um, healthcare for people um, who are poor or on low incomes, and um, Medicare um, and care for people who are um, older. Um, 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 I think from 65 years old, if I'm not mistaken. George may correct me, but um, the healthcare for people that are older is actually much better um, because I mean I think that's everybody understands that's a. a great voting block and even Republicans understand the need to cater to them, right? The kind of healthcare that they're actually trying to bring to the UK is the portion of it, the, the portion that is provided by the government for, I think it's Medicaid, um, the portion that's provided for, um, by the government for low income people in the US. So a company like Centene or United Healthcare, um, what's called maintained care, um, receives money from the government based on a whole bunch of uh, formulas um, to care for a particular number of people. And the job of the company that is providing this care is to do everything within their power to spend as little of that money that they were given by the government on care and as much of it as possible siphoned off in profit, right? And we've had testimony from it's a lawyer in Texas that we've been speaking with um, who has sued United Healthcare a few times for things like um, requiring permission from a manager for delivering a, an important and very urgent medical care, which they somehow accidentally always give too late after the person has gone beyond the point of no return or in some cases actually died. Um, doctors were sometimes in incentivized for not running specific tests, which they suspect could um, discover things that they would then have to care for, right? And a bunch, the, 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 the incentive structure is so messed up, it's so messed up. And there is a risk that that will be, in fact, I don't, it's no longer a risk. It's already in the NHS. And their project essentially is to make that the formula in the NHS. So that companies like Centene and United Healthcare, who already do this in the US, can expand their businesses into the UK, right? And I think that that is what we really do need to oppose, um, and that's what this is about. And this what that's what the ICS is about. That's what the white paper is about. That's what all of this is about. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you, John Bosco. Very very interesting. Did uh, uh, other questions or comments? Uh, Sorry, just to add, um, yeah. George also did ask about engaging um, trade unions. We we absolutely do engage with um, Unite, um, not so much with Unison. We definitely do need to improve the work we do with Unison. Um, yeah, George just um, mentioned in the chat, yeah. Um, yeah, we definitely do need to do more with Unison. We are working on a campaign at the moment. Um, you, some people may be aware if you read the lowdown, um, it was recently exposed that NHS England actually sent out a guidance, a guide, a guidance to um, NHS trusts across England, advising them to take all of their um, um, diagnostic imaging, all their radiology um, equipment and department, and put them into a arm's length private company. Um, and the suggestion is that they either do that, create the companies themselves, and put it in those companies or they actually put them in what they call the commercial partner, essentially a private company. So outsource it or privatize it completely. And we've been working on potentially running a campaign on that issue alongside Unite and Unison and um, um, the Royal College of Radiology and um, the other organizations um, relevant in that area. 
And I think that that gives us an opportunity to build relationships there that we can then leverage on a campaign like Centene and um, ICS. So we're definitely thinking about that. And lastly, on the issue of Trowbridge, I just discovered when George was speaking that I have been pronouncing it terribly. Um, yeah, uh, we are, I, I think that the contract for that GP practice is not coming up for renewal until 2022. Um, so we do have some time to actually build up to putting pressure on the CCG um, um, to not renew that contract. And yeah, that just brings me back to um, the question by Fliss. Um, the fact that there are a few years, just a few, actually in some cases, just a few months left on some of the contracts is an indication that these contracts have been running for at least the last four years. Um, they're normally five-year contracts and they have built into them the possibility of renewing them for another five years. And um, yes, and we're running under Art Medics, but Centene, having just bought over Art Medics, essentially inherited those contracts. And we're trying to say that this has totally changed the equation and the CCGs should take back these um, contracts and give them to traditional GP partnerships. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you, John Bosco. Uh, sorry, can, can I ask you two questions as well? I, I, I don't see anybody else asking with their hand up at the moment, but so I'll take the advantage to ask a question. I mean, one of the questions I was really interested in, as you mentioned, uh, judicial review earlier on. I mean, I wonder, given that, given that there isn't much chance of this government being friendly to the NHS, are you optimistic that we can use the courts and judicial review to actually, you know, at least prevent or minimize the risk of even greater privatization. So are the courts a good a good avenue for for a challenge? And my second uh, question really is, because of COVID and because of the backlog, you know, of sort of you know standard cases that have to be dealt with within the, the NHS. There's a there's a lot of hype, a lot of talk around. The NHS having to be more innovative and more creative about how it delivers services. Do you think there's a there's a risk that the the private sector and the champions of privatisation will use that post COVID environment to try and introduce private sector practices into the into the NHS? Um, I noticed that Lorraine actually asked some questions in the chat, so I'm going to take. Um, Mick's question yeah, and then I'll- Yes, please. Uh, I'll so what's the particular main question? I didn't spot that. I, I, I'm, I, can't, I can't multitask like you, I'm afraid, you know. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm going, to, I'm going to take yours, the last one especially because I did not write it down, so I don't want to forget. Um, yeah, I do think that there is, um, sorry, I think I may have forgotten your last question. Um, if you could write it in the chat, that'd be really welcome. Yeah, but sure. in terms of um, the courts, um, I think that the courts can potentially pose, uh, be a useful way to push back against the government, especially of course, given their majority in parliament. And we're already seeing um, organizations like the Good Law Project doing, I think a very good job in that area. And of course, most recently, um, every doctor has also been doing a brilliant job in that, in that respect. Um, we at We On It are not very, uh, we, our theory of change is, is not the legal route, right? And we 100% recognize that it could be an effective way of approaching things. And we are supporting, for example, the judicial review on Centene, but we believe in people taking action in their local areas and putting pressure on decision makers locally and forcing them to do the right thing. And we know that that does work because in Northwest London, for example, on the, the 29th of April, the primary care commissioning committee that is supposed to make decisions on whether or not to renew contracts actually met. And for the first time, they were expressing doubt that whether or not they would actually renew Santini's contract. And the reasons they were giving for that was that they did not realize the amount of public concern that existed over Santini's involvement in GP practices. Um, of course, we noticed that most more recently they have been um, kind of trying to play some games on us, so to say, because the meeting that we are trying to um, organize around um, putting pressure on them for, which is now scheduled to happen on Thursday, the 27th of May, 
was initially scheduled to happen on the 17th of June, which we thought gave us more time, but they sneakily brought the meeting forward by two weeks, um, actually more than two weeks, which um, got us scrambling yesterday, which is why I spent a great deal of my day today preparing actions that I thought I had two weeks to prepare. Right, so um, it's, it's clear that we are having an effect in terms of the pressure in the local groups in the area working on this are also having an effect. Hence, they're trying to kind of pull a fast one on us. And so that approach definitely works, but I think that the courts also are a good place to, um, at the very least, delay some of their decisions. We all we do know, of course, just to temper expectations in that respect, that the government is not shy to just ignore the courts. Um, Matt Hancock, for example, was found guilty of um, um, impropriety, but he just pretended like it didn't happen and just kept on going. Right, and I think that um, I think that there is an argument for focusing a great deal more on local decision makers and putting the spotlight on them. Those people are less, are much less. Um, uh, I don't know how how to put it in a way that's nice. Um, they're much less devilish than the government. Um, and some of those people, if they receive two hundred emails in their email box, they freak out. Um, or if they open their Twitter in the morning and see 50 people mentioning them, they freak out, right? Whereas uh, people like Matt Hancock is mentioned by 20,000 people every day on Twitter and they don't, give, they don't really care what's happening, right? So I think that focusing our action on local areas and putting pressure on local leaders has um, a lot of promise. And, and I think that this campaign is already showing that. And I hope we could continue to do that going forward. Um, yeah, and um, a mixed question was post COVID. That is correct. So there is the, the government is already trying to um, use COVID as an excuse to spend billions of pounds on private hospitals. Um, because of, um, they say the backlog in care. An important thing to um, keep in mind, though, is that private companies during the pandemic, when the government was purportedly or already investing quite a lot of money into them, were providing less care to people than they were before the pandemic, All right? So it's not like they were helping during the pandemic. They were not helping. They were doing less than before the pandemic. Um, and from my point of view, that's actually a good thing. We don't want them doing anything. We should build up the capacity of the NHS. But it's clear evidence that they have not, they did not have any hand at all in the handling of the pandemic. But of course, the government is going to try and use them or use the handling of the post-COVID backlog as an excuse. The last time we heard, we were thinking of investing up to 10 billion pounds into private um, hospitals um, to deal with the backlogs. And we know that's not going to work. Um, yes, and there is scope in that area to put pressure on them to do so. Just in terms of, um, to put pressure on them not to do so. Um, just in terms of, um, um, a campaign in that area. We're, we, we've actually been working on a campaign, um, not in terms of, we don't want to ask them don't do this because running a negative campaign doesn't always help. But I want to kind of say to them, build up the capacity of the NHS. You cut 10,000 beds in the last five years. Can we get those 10,000 beds back, right? You cut so and so amount of money from training nurses and doctors. Can we get that money back? Um, yeah, I think that um, that might be a more positive way to kind of paint that picture in the minds of people and um, hopefully get some action in that area. Um, somebody just asked if there's a chance of getting 10 billion pounds back. Um, fingers crossed, who knows? <laughs> um, I, I, I do not know um, anything you do not know in that respect. Um, I think that Lorraine also did ask a question about how to be effective in a PPG. Um, my sense is that I've never actually attended a PPG meeting because, um, as you might suspect, um, until I started working for We Own It, um, the NHS was uh, was an idea to me more than it was an actual thing in the world. <laughs> and um, so I never actually uh, got involved in a PPG. But I have been, um, since I have been um, working on this campaign, I've been discussing with people who have worked um, as part of PPGs. So I suppose what I could do is um, 
If you got involved in your local PPG and see how things are progressing, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email into We Own It. Um, the email, email address is info at weownit.org.uk. And I'll either put you in touch with somebody who can support you through that journey, or I will um, find out the answer to your question and relay it back to you. And I'm very happy to do that for anybody who sends in an email to We Own It. That's great. Uh, John Bosco, thank you so much for that. Uh, really, really helpful and practical information. There's also a question here from Chloe, who, who, who was asking really, you know, should we focus on GP practices who are not yet being courted by the private sector so we can, we can raise awareness amongst those practices so that if the private sector does come, they will be, they will be better informed and, and prepared so that they, they will be well aware of what the consequences would be if the private sector does make an approach, yeah. That is that is a very, very good point. And we've actually been doing that already on the day of action that George mentioned. Um, we had two kinds of actions that we asked people to take and hundreds of people across the country took actions on that day. Um, we asked people who lived in areas that have GP practices to go to their GP practices and potentially hold the protest with anybody who is available. But for those who live in GP practices that are not currently affected, we just asked them to take a poster that we prepared in advance that essentially said, Centene, stay away from this GP practice, something to that effect. Um, and we asked them to stay around their GP practice for some time to have conversations with people passing by. Um, and that was done with the understanding that it's quite important for us to protect in a preempt preemptive way, the GP practices that are currently not under their control. Um, but I also think that we could, do a great deal to protect those practices by fighting against Centene in the practices where they currently exist. Because I think, I think we often underestimate the power of the narrative. Um, and if we are able to push back against Centene, for example, getting Northwest London CCG to not renew their contracts with Centene, that automatically kind of sets a precedent with not a particular CCG accepting the arguments that we were making against against Centene, which makes it much easier in from the point of view of CCGs to recognize these arguments and that track record that we've been highlighting as a reason not to give Centene a contract, right? So and the moment that happens with one CCG, it becomes less likely that another CCG is going to allow it to happen. So I think kind of, intensifying the fight where they currently exist will have an effect in areas where they don't currently exist. Okay, um, any other any other last last questions? Sorry, Catherine, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, well, I don't think that comment actually reflects the, the actual situation of the CCGs, which have already informally combined while has held their last meetings and informally combined into the ICF in the local you know covering our local area um I attended their last meeting they were quite clear it was their last meeting um so I, I think the advice needs to reflect the actual situation Yes, Catherine, um, I did mention earlier, um, I think it was in answer to... Yeah, sorry, sorry, I was late. I was at the Hackney sorry. AONP meeting. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, I did mention earlier that that um, things are changing quite rapidly. Um, and with respect to the Northwest London CCG that we are um, organizing a protest for on, um, on Thursday, the 27th, um, it is still very much Northwest London CCG that's making that decision. Um, the primary care commissioning committee there um, is making a decision on the 27th of May. Yes, but um, I think that that's a very, very um, good point that things would have changed, likely um, changed very much around this area, um, closer to when the um, contract for um, the throw bridge, for example, um, um, practice comes up. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I think it's sometime in 2022 when it comes up for renewal. And I think that the actions that we decide to take then will very much reflect the situation at that time. That's uh, anybody else 
any last orders for last orders here? Any last points? Chloe, yeah. So Vicky just said that she's always um, ignored messages from her um, patient participation group to get involved. Um, I would like to officially call out Vicky um, and uh, ask her to stop doing so. <laughs> 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 and get involved and try and um, influence decisions that have been made at that level. My, my I will. Question. I tell you, this meeting Sorry. has kind of terrified me. Yeah. I'll do Absolutely, and me. Um, but I just think it's, it is terrifying that all of this has happened, even though we've been aware slightly that stuff was going on in the background. But we've got to really mobilise a lot more people. That's true. And um, I would like to actually give quite a lot of credit to organisations like QMP right now. Um, who are doing a lot of that work. Uh, I think We Own It is also doing that. I think we often treat treat these issues as if it's a question of educating people. Like um, once they know what's happening, they will get involved and take action. But it's not always a question of educating people. Um, people are nominally aware of what's happening. Um, I think that what we really do need to put a great deal of effort into is mobilizing people, kind of, moving people from the point of like being aware that this is something they hate to taking action about it. And I think that's something we need to do better, no doubt, as a movement. And of course, as we own it and we continuously try and improve the way we work every day. But yes, I, I totally agree with you, Chloe. I think we need to do a great deal better um, to mobilize people to get involved in this. And I think that starts with, of course, getting involved in your local patient participation group. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Vicky, did you have, did you want to make a comment or was that, was that okay, did you? Okay. Okay, folks, listen, it's, um, it's 25 past eight now and we were due to finish at half eight. And um, I think I just wanted to make a few sort of comments to round off the evening. I mean, first of all, I just want to say a huge thanks to John Bosco. What a, what a fantastic evening, uh, an incredibly informative and really, really helpful calls to action, you know, it's always great to sort of hear a speaker who explains what a problem is, explains just how significant it is, but more importantly, tells us what we can actually do about it, you know. And I really hope that um, there are plenty of people on this call tonight who will take up the offer to support the campaigns and actually, you know, uh, you know do more to raise awareness of the, the creeping and stealth privatization of the NHS. If you have not sent an email to uh, members of the PCCC of Northwest London, um, please do take um, a minute or two. It will not take more than one minute actually to click to send an email using the link that we I've just put in the chat. Yeah. Would be really helpful. Thank you so much.